told with the tournament referee Brian Early. He listened to their concerns, but clearly, you know, this could be a watershed moment for for men's tennis, women's tennis as well, that the players can get together and actually affect real change. Where was David Ferrer? Jules Muller and Donald Young, shouldn't they have been in there as well? It is great the players get together. All of them should have been in there. Out on our court here, Grandstand, Annie Murray was out a good four or five minutes before Donald Young was. So there was definitely some confusion on getting the players here at the same time. And Annie Murray was complaining before the match even started that it was wet in the background. So the one thing is for sure, we're all part of the show. But when... The, the court is wet or there is some issue or it is missing a little bit they need to listen to the players and and, and take it to heart and hopefully like i said uh, patrick said this will be a watershed moment where the players can come together but I, I still was a little disappointed the other three players were not in that meeting well john you certainly have plenty of experience in you know dealing with situations like this so uh, th this is not the first time that we've seen something like this happen but uh, it's happening here in a big way am i allowed patrick to give a little history tennis Please. history now we yeah, got to come to all right. Absolutely. Remember that before 1972, Cliff will chime in on this when we're finished, players had absolutely no power whatsoever. They were told what to do. As a matter of fact, most of the time, they barely paid them anything. Finally, in 72, we got a union. 73, Stan Smith, God bless him, he boycotted Wimbledon because of a player, Nikki Pillich, who was asked to play Davis Cup, chose not to play Davis Cup. And because he chose not to play Davis Cup, the Federation suspended him for six months. The players showed that they had a backbone. They were willing. Do you, how many players, first of all, do you think would not defend their title the way Stan Smith did? It's the only time they'd ever won Wimbledon. They boycotted. They got a little bit of power, a key little bit. Late 70s, I came into the picture with guys like Connors, Vitas Garolitis, the late great Vitas Garolitis, Guillermo Vilas, Bjorn Borg. The agents got together. They said, we're not going to be pushed around. Let, let's face it, it matters what the top players want. That's what really matters. They're going to help the game, I believe, if the top players are happier. The agents went to the federations. We got a lot of things done. They wanted us to play every week. We would have played 52 weeks a year if it was up to these tournament directors and the federation. So finally we got to play. Guess what, though? Can I go on or am I taking too long? You're on a roll. I'm on a roll. Thank you. So at that particular point, the agents got all the power. How in the world were agents representing the players, representing the tournaments, representing the sponsors, representing the TV people? These are the IMGs of the world, the pro -sers at that time. The players sit back and say, that's completely absurd. Finally, later in the 80s, when guys were getting a little bit old and gray like myself, even Yvonne Leno, we sat outside the gate at the U.S. Open at Flushing Meadows, I think it was 1989, we had a guy by the name of Hamilton Jordan who was running the ATP, which has had basically very little power to this point. We finally had an opportunity to step up and say, this is all the top players met the week before the Open. We said, we want to be involved with the major events. We want to be partners in the major events. We want to be part of the revenue sharing so that we can give pensions to the players that have absolutely nothing, that we could give some of this money to charity, it was some type of behind-the-scenes deal was struck where absolutely none of that took place. And we cut a deal with tournament directors, the non-Grand Slam tournament directors, where they said, look, there'll be three votes, three votes for tournament directors, three votes for the players. The deciding vote is the, AT, the guy that runs the ATB, Hamilton Jordan. I personally disagreed along with the other top players. We should be involved in revenue sharing with the slams. We should be partners. The, of course the slams don't want anything to do with that. What about a replay of a, of a turn when they replay all these matches? How about can the players don't get a piece of that? <laughs> for the pinch, not just for the top guys, because they can afford it. We, so I reluctantly agreed. I said, okay, we will accept what you're saying to us. We disagree with it totally. As a matter of fact, they made a system that was a best of system when we said we wanted to play less. I said, at least we'll win the votes, Chris. 3-3, three, three, you'll win every vote, 4-3. Then they changed another rule that if it was 3-3, three, three, that wouldn't be passed. <laughs> so what ended up happening is that major events are more powerful than they've ever been, and they continue, I repeat, continue to push around the top players. And hopefully, oh wait, by the way, wasn't there a book, You Cannot Be Serious, where they said there should be a commissioner of tennis? <laughs> you remember that? Wait, you only got to the 80s, John. We I got, got to the 90s. Got to the players. Okay. So, uh, John, I, I was in that yeah. meeting, and uh, exactly what you said. 
That was one of those great meetings that we came out of a poker game with our pockets turned out upside down. We, we lost in that battle. Well, guys, don't you think, though, that the, obviously there are massive issues in this sport. You just detailed some of it. There's the more specific issue about walking on a court that the players don't feel is safe. The organizers felt it was okay. Clearly, the players' issues and the players' opinion should trump everything else where their safety is involved. But the background for what you gave, the resentment of maybe the fact that there is so much money, especially in these slams, and that the players are just exploited a bit. That seems to feed into the ad the attitude uh, about this much smaller issue. Especially when you're talking about a guy who's trying to become one of, he is one of the all-time greats in Rafa Nadal. He's trying to defend his U.S. Open title. What the hell difference does it make whether he comes out at 12 or 12 or 10? I mean, in the bigger scheme of things, look, we'll be happy to see matches today. Let's be honest. They knew pretty darn well that they were going to have there for a very, very short period of time. It goes without saying, Chris, it should, you have to be extra careful for any of the players, not just the top players, any of the players in these conditions. And it's a shame it's come to that. However, I hope that, that, that what just happened will lead the players to get together, whoever it is, get some real leadership to go in so there eventually could be a partnership. We get treated worse than any other sport in terms of revenue <coughs> sharing, by far. You know, and, and, and listen, by the way, Brad, you remember, how much money did I win in the 1979 when I won the Open? Uh, Take a guess. Uh, wait a minute, uh, 34 grand. $39,000 <laughs> to hey, win this. Hey, John, until we get, listen, the head of the ATP who's now stepping down, and, and that uh, that position is open, until we get a commissioner, somebody yes. that actually makes decisions, this 3-3 three, three vote that, that it is, and he's the decider, I mean, the players, to me, still are not represented the way they should be, and a commissioner of football, commissioner of basketball, commissioner of baseball, when he makes decisions and does things, there, there's a lot more substance to it. A lot of those, those commissioners, by the way, are all pretty unpopular with the players that are in those well, by, by the way, Chris, there's no player union. There's we have no, no player union. There's, there's, there's no player union. And that's that's, that's exactly. really the crux of the issue. Well, let's get in uh, Cliff and, and Darren yeah. of their yeah. arms. Cliff, you were one, one, one of the pioneers, yeah. Cliff. You were one of the pioneers. Yeah. Is this little day when this specific issue about wet courts, do you see this as being some sort of a, a, a turning point or no pun intended, a watershed? Uh, yeah, watershed. I, I, that's a good word, Chris. Um, John, by the way, was very articulate in talking about the history of the ATP and where things really were born. Uh, f and my feeling so for, and then what Patrick said is also quite true, it is n the ATP is not a union uh, it, it, because they own the tour outside of the uh, Grand Slam tournament. So right. they, when the ATP goes to somebody like the US Open or Wimbledon, for example, they are not in really any control of the situations. So bear in mind this, we are not talking about a union. I think that's really important. But Chris, you're bringing us back to what the crux of this matter is. These courts were not playable. I believe the players. I believe that that's true. These courts were not playable, and they shouldn't have gone out there that early. Well, I think also, Cliff, you can't blame the USTA for when the rain does clear, trying to get the courts dry and thinking the courts were playable, getting the players on the court. But I think the real problem came even out here when we saw Andy Roddick come out here. He got onto the court and looked quite dry. And once he stepped on the court, he could see that it was still quite slippery. So he got the umpire down, the chair umpire, Carlos Bernardi, complained about it, obviously. He and, he and Ferrer spoke about it. It. And when you have the players and the umpire all discussing whether or not it's playable or not, it's probably not playable. So they probably should have sent them back in or waited for five or ten minutes to see if the rain did clear. Obviously, it was still looking pretty dodgy out there as well. But I, I agree with everything you guys just said there as well. And I found it really interesting that Rafael Nadal, the first thing he said when he came for that pre-match interview was the ATP. He blamed the ATP. Yeah. Now, there's a lot of frustration there because I really think over the last few years there's been no real strong or visible leadership from the ATP. I think a commissioner of tennis would be great. I don't think it's going to happen in our foreseeable future, but whoever the ATP appoints next has to be a strong leader. I think you said the players don't feel protected. That could apply to this small issue, but also to much bigger issues. You've had this top okay. 10 comment because they're the ones who are on court. But for her part, Serena Williams via Twitter offering support saying, preach, Rafael Nadal, preach. And then this is Serena words, my fellow <laughs> booty brother, <laughs> hash, go big butts, LOL. That's, that's Serena's
Yeah, we like it. I like it a lot. Very nice. So Serena at the top of the women's game offering her support for the positions taken by the top men here. Interesting conversation, guys. We enjoyed the, the history. I'm happy I agreed more with Brad in that last <laughs> ten minutes more than I've had in a long time. <laughs> and we can all agree that we'd like to see tennis, but not before four o'clock Eastern time, we're told here. And I actually do have those uh, slam bonies out, so we'll we'll try it again with a little cooperation and be back live after this on a frustrating day.